Yeah. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. Good morning. On behalf of uh, the EGSPLI group of institutions, I welcome you all. And this is uh, uh, Dr. V. Sivaraman, Director, Industry Institute Relations. I welcome you all for the international webinar on eco-friendly magnesium technology for engineering and biomedical applications. This is the first time we jointly are organizing this uh, international uh, event along with uh, Southeastern University Sri Lanka and Multimedia University. Both the universities are our partners in academics and research. And uh, on behalf of Southeastern University, uh, Dr. Yu Farooq, uh, head of the department, is representing. And on behalf of the Multimedia University, Dr. Ervina Evzan, uh, uh, director, is representing. Now, I would like to introduce uh, uh, our uh, today's speaker. And uh, he's a world-renowned scientist and and is a world-renowned scientist and academician. He is recognized as top 1% scientist of the world. I would like to read his biography, a short biography. Dr. Manoj Gupta was a former head of materials division of the mechanical engineering department and director designate of material science and engineering initiative at NUS Singapore. He did his Bachelor of Engineering from VRC Nagpur in 1984, first class with distinction, Master of Engineering from IIC Bangalore in 1987, gold medalist, PhD from University of California, USA 1992, and postdoctoral research at University of Alberta, Canada in 1992. In August 2017, he was highlighted among top 1% scientists of the world positioned by the university by the Universal Scientific Education and Research Network and among 2.5% among scientists as per research gate. To his credit are this integrated merit deposition technique and hybrid microwave printing technique to synthesize alloys, micro or nano composites. He has published over five to three peer-reviewed journal papers and owns two US patents and one trade secret. His current H index is seven, G index is 47, the latest is greater than 1000. He has also co authored six books published by John V. Springer and USA and edited many others. He is editor in chief and also editor of four international peer reviewed journals. In 2018, he was announced World Academy Championship winner in the area of biomedical sciences by international agencies and ratings. A multiple award winner. He actively collaborated or visited as a researcher, visiting and chair professor in Japan, France, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, China, USA, and India. In this introduction, I request uh, Dr. Ervina uh, Multimedia University to welcome uh, Professor Manoj Gupta from NUS. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Prof. Siva. So thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Manov Gupta. So I, we from Multimedia University, welcome you for this uh, webinar. Thank you. I request now Dr. Yu Farooq, uh, Head Department of Mechanical Engineering, Southeastern University, Sri Lanka, to welcome Professor Manoj Gupta. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sivaraman, for your initiative in organizing this webinar. I am uh, Dr. Yu Faro, Head of Mechanical Engineering at the Southeastern University of Sri Lanka. I myself is a graduate in 
material science and engineering and uh, i am pleased that we have a professor who is now working on magnesium alloys which are biomaterials and they are now uh, gaining momentum in the applications of biomedical engineering and in other engineering fields i welcome uh, professor manoj gupta to deliver his uh, lecture on behalf of the southeastern university of sri lanka thank you thank you thank you so now i welcome uh, professor manoj gupta to start the session well to start with i would like to extend my thanks to uh, professor sivaraman dr alvirina and professor um, farooq i am trying to now um, share my talk are you able to see it yes sir are you able to see my screen no no not yet yes sir. okay turn screen share off uh, just give me a second um no no now it's okay it's okay now ah uh, okay now you have to maximize it sir. yeah are you able to see now yeah yeah it's okay now okay yeah. yeah so my sincere thanks to the organizing committee coming from uh, india professor shiva raman dr alvirina from malaysia multimedia university and uh, professor farooq uh, uh, from sri lanka uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, i'd like to wish you a very good morning in india and uh, i think in sri lanka also and good afternoon for the people in malaysia uh, i'm going to talk today on uh, eco friendly magnesium technology for engineering and biomedical application uh, this talk actually is focusing on a few words the first word you see is eco friendly because when we use a material you have to ensure that in the 21st century and beyond you have to use a material which does not toxify your planet in which you are living in so that way the magnesium fits into that category because it is not a toxic element and then i will like to highlight that how this material which has almost a 100 year old history is suddenly back into the limelight for both engineers and doctors now if you look at this slide at the bottom of the slide on the left hand side you will see the ladies here and some gents who are trying to use magnesium for tracer bullets bombs and the lightweight equipment during the second world war there was a scarcity of the fossil fuel uh, because of the war and so people realized the lightweight concept because of the scarcity of fuel at that time but the environmental concern was not there then we have also seen if you look at this middle picture that magnesium was used in the aerospace sector also and if you look at the right hand picture you see that it is in the automobile sector and all these thing were i'm talking of 1940s to 50s zone so it was there in practically many many engineering and defense application to start with now if you have to choose a material the ball game has changed you cannot just use a material for any application anymore you have to ensure that if you are using a material it should be abundant because once a material is abundant it is sustainable that means you can use it for a longer time without worrying about that i will be depleted of the resources and then what will happen to all the technology that i have developed the second point is it should be non toxic non toxic because if you use a toxic material and you dump it like in many countries the materials are dumped in the water bodies or landfill and all the same then they can toxify because the water is used in irrigation the water is used uh, by the animals drinking and everything and that start affecting the health of all the living organism whether they are plants or animals and at the end of the day it comes in the the toxicity comes in our food plate or dinner plate and then it affects us indirectly now the 
Material can be sustainable and non-toxic, but at the same time, it should have acceptable properties as required by the end application. So it is very important that the material or its form should have acceptable property for the application we are targeting for. And then it to reach a common man, not to reach a rich man or only to reach defense application, which are cost insensitive. If it has to reach a common man, its cost has to be reasonably good. And obviously the cost will be good if it is abundant. The next thing is that it is a new feature. It's a geopolitical issues. So you cannot just use a material which is solely present or exists in one country. What happens if you develop the technology for that material and some political relation get bad between your country and that country, that country stops supplying you the material and now you don't know what to do. And all your investment over the years and decades goes down the drain. So it has to be very important that a suitable material should not have geopolitical issue. That means it should be present in multiple places on this planet. Now, all these factors are suitable for use of magnesium in all the application which I am trying to bring in your attention today. So we use magnesium because it is very important for the planet Earth. It is very important for the health of plants. It is very important for the health of humans and for a good health of animals. So it covers practically everything. So how it is important for planet Earth, for example. We have seen the change in the global weather patterns. In India, for example, in 2015, in the city of Chennai, we have seen the flash floods. Billions of dollars were lost. And then we have seen the near drought in 2019. In Alberta, Canada, at minus 10 degrees centigrade in 2016, we have seen the forest fire because of the very dry and very dry air. So it allowed the wood to burn. And then we have seen 45 degrees in Paris in 2019. And if you have read the news one week back, 38 degrees centigrade has reached in Arctic Circle. 38 degrees in Arctic Circle, which are supposed to be always near to zero or in the sub-zero zone. So that is the kind of weather pattern that we are uh, witnessing because of the improper use of our technologies and the materials. And I'll come to that a bit later on. Now this slide shows you a very big iceberg which chipped off from the Arctic Circle and floating and passing through a small town in Canada. And you can see its land scale here and you can compare it with the size of the humans which you can see in the background. This is because the Arctic ice is melting. And why the Arctic ice is melting? Because of the global warming. And how the global warming take place? Because of the emission of the greenhouse gases and what is the most important greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide and the who emits carbon dioxide it is a fossil fuel use so because of the thinning of this arctic uh, circle ice now the sunlight whatever is available can penetrate and suddenly the ice is turning green and researchers try to find out just in this year that why this ice is turning green because now the phytoplanktons which is kind of plant are now getting activated so basically when the arctic ice melts as i'll come a bit later it's going to raise a sea level which is going to affect many low-lying countries so in view of this weather changes that has been witnessed and recorded very aggressively from 1990s at a much higher frequency. Many countries in the world came out to agree to Paris Agreement, which was ratified in 2016. The basic philosophy behind the Paris Agreement is that let us keep the temperature of our planet not beyond 2 degrees C when you compare with the temperature, average temperature in 1880, which is a pre-industrial level. Why 2 degrees centigrade? Because they say that if we go at 1.5 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level, 
then these weather patterns are going to become very frequent and will affect us in a very bad way. And currently we are at 1.2 degree centigrade level. So we have only 0.3 degree centigrade to play with now. Now what happens if we reach 2 degree centigrade and beyond? That is uh, what is such a, is a tipping point. When you say the tipping points, each of us will see the catastrophe due to very unpredictable weather changes, whether it comes in form of typhoons, storms, hurricanes, excessive rains, we do not know. Drought, we don't know. So most of the countries agreed on the Paris Agreement and they suggested that let's cut down the CO2 emission by 2025 by about 2 billion tons. And the transportation sector is going up, aerospace sector is going up. And in that way, while COVID-19 has very badly affected the economies of the countries and the whole world, it has one positive side. Because the Paris Agreement said that 2025 you have to cut down the CO2 emission by 2 billion tons and with COVID-19 effect and because of all the inhibition in international travel, domestic travel, ground transportation and everything, it is projected that we'll cut down the 2.5 billion tons by the end of the year. So in a way, this is seen as a respite for the global warming now. So let's get back to the issue that what emits carbon dioxide, which are these industrial sectors, electricity sector, industry sector, and transportation sector. We have limited choices in electricity sector because you can go with the solar energy, you can go for the wind energy, but the amount of energy generated by them is still quite limited. So people are trying to go for the nuclear energy, but the proliferation is much slower and then we are always afraid that it can lead to the uh, country getting the nuclear warfare, uh, things like nuclear bombs. So we are still working on that. Progress has been made, but it's a long way to go. Industry is also taking care of it by using cleaner fuels, by using uh, specialized catalysts and filters to cut down on the green gas thing. So we are still working on that. But another sector, which is a transportation sector, is one of the biggest sector where we can easily address this problem. And the very easy way to address this problem of reducing the CO2 emission is to reduce the weight of the device. The device can be an aeroplane, the device can be a car, the device can be a train, for example. It can be a rocket, it can be a satellite. So it can be anything. The basic fundamental is uh, very simple. You reduce the vehicle mass and your fuel consumption per kilometer reduces. If the fuel burning is reduced, CO2 emission reduces and you are addressing the global warming. And it is something which is very easy to adapt. So many countries like North American countries and the European countries way back in 2010, they say, okay, let's do something about it. And they set a target to reduce the weight of the vehicle or the fuel consumption by about 25%. That means from 130 gram of CO2 per kilometer, they want to reach it to 95 gram of CO2 by 2020. So we'll see how much they have achieved. Most likely the report will come next year. And that translates to a mileage of about 30 kilometer per liter for the car you drive, for example. All right, so let's try to have a, how serious is this issue is practically underestimated by most of the people. And that is where this slide is very important. Where are we? What is the health of planet Earth? We are already in the sixth mass extinction event. When we say mass extinction event, that means you lose 70 to 95% of the plant, animals, and the microorganisms. While first five have been created by the natural disasters, the sixth one is created by humans because of the technology proliferation, because of the fossil fuel usage. And because of this greenhouse gas emission, the CO2 levels are highest in last 800,000 years. Uh, and if you go with the same level, Arctic Ocean will be ice-free by 2030, which is only a decade left to that. 
and all this ice which is going to melt is going to raise the sea level which has already increased by about 8.5 centimeter from 1993 till about three to four years back and that is a very bad news of the low-lying countries they may lose out completely in this race and then scientists have also witnessed that the number of extreme events like droughts forest fire floods tropical storm which i just indicated have doubled since 1990s and this information is five years back now so it is going up so let's look at the doomsday clock doomsday clock means when doomsday clock is uh, uh, at 12 o'clock sharp that means most of us are going to have very very bad experience or will experience something bad and what that bad is we don't know now this doomsday clock uh, this uh, needle is moved based on three big factors nuclear weapons proliferation climate change and the new technology so you can see that as an engineers we are primarily responsible for the movement of the doomsday clock so climate change is important and we have seen greenhouse gases new technologies because they are contaminating our water bodies and the land bodies like never before now if you bring the science to the mythology or to the religious aspect or the cultural beliefs i will say like that then you will see that mayan people uh, they suggested that they created a calendar mayan calendar and they say that it the the people will come to an end on 21st of December 2012. Well, nothing really happened, but we have only seen the Paris Agreement did come in around that time. And then we go to the Hindu concept of the time of Kali Yuga, which is supposed to end in 2025, common era. So it's not like everyone will cease to exist in 2025 or 2012 as per the Mayan. The idea is that if you see the Paris Agreement, their target is also 2025. So 2012 and 2025 may be present a window for us to take the proper measures to stem or to negate all the mistakes that we have done before. If we take the correct steps, we will avoid all these things. And if we don't take the correct steps, then we are heading for much and much tougher time. Obviously, this is realized by the young generation because now the young generation is much more knowledgeable. You have social media, the communication flow is much faster. And you see the young generation is protesting practically all over the world. We need a green new deal. We want uh, earth to be green and so on and so forth. The idea is to use the materials and technologies responsibly so that our future generation gets the place to live which is at least similar or better than us now how does this magnesium relates to the health of the plants for example the work done in uh, australia have shown that if your soil is contaminated then the plants have the capability to take this contamination in their system now what you see here is the eucalyptus leaf in the top picture where the gold is found in the transportation system and the leaves. Similar observation was made for manganese also and for the gold again for a different type of leaf. So what is the message here? If you contaminate the soil bodies by irresponsible use of elements, then they can go in the plants. Now, we use aluminum as a lightweight element now and aluminium is a neurotoxic element if you expose your plants to aluminium contaminated soil you see the length of the root is stunted that means it's much shorter than a soil which does not contain aluminium the root length signifies how healthy the plant is or the plant length and the height and the and the number of leaves but for the aluminium to be absorbed by the plant there's a condition that the soil pH has to be less than 5.5. And apparently, if you look at the statistic, you will see that 60% of the world's potential crop growing soil is highly acidic. 
So that means if you want to use aluminium, you have to be extremely responsible to recycle it or to put in the landfill so that it does not go in the food chain. If it goes in the food chain, you are heading for a bad news. If you use magnesium and even if you illegally dump it into the water bodies or in the soil bodies, the magnesium is a nutrition element which only improve your length of the roots and the plant's health. So it is okay for using plant and even illegally dumping it because it's only going to do a good job to the health of the plants. Now, how about the animals and humans? The picture that you see here is a dog on the left hand side, which is turning blue because this guy was drinking water from a canal where the water was contaminated. On the right hand side, you see a fictional character, Hulk, from Avenger movies, which most of you might have seen coming from Hollywood. And his body is also contaminated by something. And so he comes out as a freak. So essentially, whatever you are seeing here in the fiction or in the reality, such as in the case of the dog, that can happen to the humans in the real life in next 10 to 20 years if we do not stop the level of contamination in what we eat and what we drink. So how magnesium is useful for human health? It is involved in more, hundred, more than 300 chemical reactions in the body. It is required by the muscular system, nervous system, cardiovascular system, immunity system, and if you are having trouble in sleeping, maybe your body is deficient in magnesium. And it's easily found in many places like vegetables, grains, beans, nuts, and fish. And you will be surprised that it is the fourth most abundant cation in the human body. So human body is used to it because it needs it. Now let's try to have a look at aluminum, which is commonly used in automobile sector and in our homes also when we use aluminum utensils. But you must know that aluminum is a neurotoxin. It can lead to the cognitive deficiency. Professor? Yeah. Hello. Professor, uh, there is one dialogue box. Uh, yeah. There is, sorry for the interference. Uh, there is one dialogue box in your screen. You Can you please press hide? Uh, let Below. Me, I have to escape because I cannot see from here. Let me escape. Okay. Hi. Uh, Okay. Yeah, these yeah. things just keep coming. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, there is one option hide. Hide. Okay. There is one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Now. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, Thank fine. you. Yeah. So apparently, uh, it can have the adverse effect on central nervous system and the reproductive system. And its link with the Alzheimer disease is very well established because once you take aluminium, it can go and make deposits in the brain which lead to the Alzheimer disease and maybe some other neurological disorders. And who are the most susceptible section of the society? Like any other disease, the first one to get affected are the infants, elderly people, and people with the pre-existing condition like the renal functions. So as a result of that, World Health Organization is always recommending to use or reduce the use of aluminum in the food intake. Magnesium can also be used as a medicine. For example, tinnitus, which is a uh, uh, hearing problem. And for example, in the US, 15% of the US population suffers from it. You can address that using magnesium and vitamin A, C, and E to treat this condition. So it is also used as a medicine. And apparently, the people who are exposed to the noisy condition are the one like soldiers, workers, and the normal individuals. Now, since magnesium is required in the body to the extent of up to 400 milligram per day next to only calcium, it is also used as a biomaterial. So essentially, people have already starting to put magnesium in the form of a stent and the fracture fixation devices like compression screws and plates. Magnesium is also very useful in mitigating electromagnetic radiation. Now, in the modern world, each of us use electronic gadgets. Practically, each of us have a mobile phone in our pocket. Each of us may be having a laptop food grinders, TV, fridge. 
these are the essential items and maybe many more electronic gadgets in our home. Each of these electronic gadget release electromagnetic waves, like microwaves also. Now, you will be surprised that electromagnetic radiation is the fifth largest pollution after noise, water, air, and solid waste pollution. Once you are exposed to it, it induces current in the body, which is beyond the current of human body. As a result, body doesn't know what to do with this kind of thing, and it adversely affects the metabolism and hormone production. Once this adverse effects start building in over the time, accordingly, you start seeing the health issues. And that is why the World Health Organization has put electromagnetic radiation as group 2B, which is possibly carcinogenic. And this pollution is not like water pollution, which is localized. It's not like air pollution, which is also reasonably localized, but not as much. This pollution is every human being in the modern world is affected. And this damage is accumulated over the time. So in the young age, you may not see the effect, but it is accumulating in your body. And when you grow old beyond 40 or beyond 50, then you start seeing the adverse effects on your health. So we try to see how the magnesium works against aluminum, which is currently used for electromagnetic shielding. And we did some work in the radio wave frequency, in the microwave frequency, and you can see that the magnesium is superior to aluminum in the radio wave frequency, and it is similar to aluminum in microwave frequency. So what it tells you is that I am now replacing aluminum by magnesium. It is 35% lighter, so I've reduced the weight of my phone and my laptop and everything, which is a good news. And also I'm trying to replace a toxic material from a non-toxic material or a nutritional element. So that is the winning point of using magnesium in the electromagnetic shielding. So where is magnesium? Is the group 2A? You can see here's a red box here. Magnesium sits right here and it has certain positives like it has a one of the lowest melting point among the structural materials at 650 degrees centigrade. Its density is only 1.74 gram per cc. It has one of the best specific strength, good damping and a good electromagnetic shielding. It has acceptable ductility, modulus and the cost. Only negative which comes with magnesium is its low corrosion resistance in the wet condition. So let's try to compare it with the workhorses of engineering and biomedical application. There are three elements, aluminum, titanium, and steels. Now look at this chart here. The density of magnesium is the lowest. The melting point of magnesium is the lowest. Specific modulus of the magnesium is similar to even titanium and steels. And its specific strength is only next to titanium, while its cost will be one fifth of the titanium. So it can be used to replace these elements, provided we have enough magnesium-based material in the market. Processing advantages. It needs low energy. It can be costed very well. It can be machined very well. So that means, what, is, what does it mean? That you can, or the magnesium-based material can be turned into finished product faster. Why is this statement important? Because if you can convert the magnesium into a finished product faster, you save on the man hours, you save on the time and the cost of your material or component will be much cheaper. So that is an advantage which other materials may not be able to give it to you. So the question is, are we short of magnesium? The first criteria, abundant, sustainability. The answer is no. It's the sixth most abundant element in the earth's crust and third most dissolved mineral in the seawater. How much we have magnesium? It is almost 12 times that of aluminum. That means if you can use aluminum for 100 years, for example, you can use magnesium for more than 1200 years. It's sustainable. The only metallic element which is beyond by mass than magnesium is iron. Okay, let's try to see what are the 10 most abundant elements in the universe? People are trying to go and colonize moon and the Mars in the near future. So let's try to have a look in the universe. So you see that magnesium is even higher than 
I run in the whole universe. And that is why I term that magnesium is a God's own element. It is the most abundant metallic element in the whole universe. So question is that we have seen and witnessed extensive use of magnesium during the Second World War time. What happens? So the research community is asking, which is shown by this clownfish, which is the name of the character is Merlin in the very famous and hit movie Finding Nemo, asking from Dory, the fish which suffers from memory loss, short term memory loss. So the Dory is the industrial community here and says 50 years of memory loss. So now magnesium is coming in. So to tell you the potential of magnesium, I'm bringing you some applications to you. You see that in the Beatles car, Herbie Goes Banana, famous Hollywood movie series, they used 20 kg of magnesium in the Beatles cars, which are very famous. It was used in the engine components way back in 1970s. People say that magnesium is flammable. True, it is flammable, but if it is, it has to be in the powder form. So in the bulk form, the answer is no. So it's a very big misconception in the people. General Motors, a, com uh, a company based in USA is trying to, not trying, they have already put magnesium boot area in the General Motor cars. Selling point is 75% lighter than steel and 33% lighter than aluminum. Another brand name, Porsche. Porsche use uh, magnesium sheets in the roof area. They compare with aluminum and CFRP, carbon fiber reinforced plastic, and they arrive at the conclusion that magnesium is the thinnest, strongest, and the lightest material. And they were just by replacing this roof sheet, they were able to cut down 10 kgs from their car weight. South Koreans have done a wonderful job and they have created the whole roadmap about almost 10 years back. And you can see the wheels coming of the magnesium, the steering wheel, even in India, Marutu Suzuki car use the steering wheels, the lamp casings and many other parts have been projected to be used and are used in many more automobiles nowadays. Americans are also working on that. And in 2010, roughly, they say that the use of magnesium is only 5 kg in the car and they want to take it to 160 kg by 2020. How much they have achieved? We don't have, we have not received the report yet. But this is about 3200% rise. And that is why when you see this graph on the top, you see that consumption of magnesium is going up and up. So since the deadline of Paris Agreement and all this thing is 2025, you can expect, and most of the car companies are supposed to compl comply with the carbon footprint, you can expect a lot of magnesium to be used in every vehicle in our planet. Let's try to have a look at the aerospace sector. Because I use the word planet, so it is not only cars, but it's also planes and the rockets and the ships also. So 1947s have seen the Convair aircraft with a lot of magnesium in the airframe. Then Convair B-36 bomber used 8.6 tons of magnesium. Sikorsky helicopter used almost 115 kg of magnesium. Lockheed F-80C used completely was made of magnesium, no issues. And Russian bomber, 1.5 tons of magnesium. So magnesium is always there in the defense sector, in the fighter aircrafts, in all the countries, including our Tejas or light combat aircraft. So after a lot of persuasion and looking back into the history, Federal Aviation Authority finally in 2015 lifted the ban on use of magnesium in the commercial aircraft. Now, because you have to reduce the carbon footprint, so they have no choice now. So this is just by replacing the seats which are currently made of aluminium, you can save 360 kg per plane or about 4.2 tons for a 700 seater Airbus A380. And that is a lot of weight saving, which will translate into the fuel saving, which will again translate into the reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions. Let's go to the maritime sector. 
This is a defense application showing amphibious vehicle. A amphibious vehicle is the one which can move in the land and in the sea. If it has to travel a longer distance and to achieve a faster speed, it has to be lighter. And that is where the magnesium is coming in. In the cruise ships, for example, many of the cruise ships engines are made of magnesium. In the defense application like armed robotic vehicles, you can use magnesium to cut down on the frame. And a recent calculation has said that in a smaller armed robotic vehicles, you can save up to 17% for a six ton vehicle and about 15% for a 25 ton vehicle. So that means you need less fuel and you give these vehicles more battle time. And I have not yet talked about the use of magnesium in many structural components in electronic sector, like in the Samsung phone, TV frames, laptops, in robotics, where traditionally steel is used. But if you use steel, it's very heavy. You have to use much more energy. And the time to move a heavy structure is also slow. It doesn't move very fast. So if you have magnesium, 75% weight saving, Consequently, you will save on the energy and your response time also will improve. High speed trains where the Japanese have almost simulated the use of magnesium based material in the sleeper trains and they have already simulated and the component level testing was going on two to three years back. So you will not be surprised that all the sleeper that you see in this image are all made of magnesium in the new trains which will roll by. So with this snapshot on application in many areas, let me try to tell you how do we make this material. It is not difficult at all. All the metal based materials are made using either the liquid metallurgy route or the powder metallurgy route in which you can take the matrix as magnesium. And for if you want to make composite, you can add the reinforcement like the one which is shown below like alumina, yttria, silicon carbide. This technique, DMD technique or disintegrated multiportion technique was conceptualized by us in 1995. And what you do is that you take the material in the crucible, we use the graphite crucible, we heat it to a desired temperature. Typically we use 750 degrees centigrade. We homogenize the material or a composite material. We bottom pour it and when the metal is pouring down, you hit with the argon gas jets to disintegrate that and then we get the ingot. This picture shows the ingot on the top left hand side image, magnesium billet and the extruded rod, which can be used for component fabrication or whatever you want to do with that. You can even roll those ingots. Then we, the people also in the material industry make the material using the powder metallurgy method in which they can take, uh, if they want to make an alloy, they put one powder with other powder. If they want to make composite, they add the magnesium powder with the reinforcement, blend it using either a V-blender or planetary ball mill, compact it into a billet like the one shown here, and then you can sinter it. Traditionally, people are using the conventional furnaces to sinter the material, which is time consuming step. And we have, the difference we made was that we started using the microwaves. So how does the microwave works? Microwave, we created a setup from a microwave which you use in your home. So it is not something very special or out of the world or very expensive. It costs you like thousand dollar in the market. So we created a setup in which you take two crucibles, inside crucible, outside crucible, and you fill your silicon carbide, which works as a microwave susceptor in here. And then you enclose that into an insulation cover shown by the yellow areas here. You pre-calibrate the microwave setup. And for every minute, you will you, you can record a temperature. So for example, to center magnesium-based material, we need 640 degrees centigrade. So we know that in 14 minutes, one four minutes, we can reach the temperature. So switch on the microwave, switch it off at 14 minutes. How much you save on the time? 90% because the same operation will take 170 minutes in a conventional setup. How much energy you save? More than 90%. So basically it becomes a green process. And you get the material with a similar or better properties than the conventional method. This animation shows that how the microwave comes and heat the billet from 
inside to outside as well as outside to inside. So it's a two wave heat front which lead to a very homogeneous temperature distribution. You can get the bullet which can be extruded, no defects, nothing if you do it properly. Now, once you use the material, it is very important to analyze it to ensure that they have the right property which is needed for the end application. So many of this material we investigate for microstructure properties and also for corrosion. So my focus in this talk is on nanocomposite. Um, in nanocomposite is a material in which you have a reinforcement at the nano lens scale, the one that you see on your right hand side, which shows very fine alumina particle. If the size of the particle is in the micron lens zone, you call it as a micro composite. So that's a very easy way to develop nano composite. Just use the reinforcement in the nano lens scale. And when I say nano lens scale, the lens scale has to be, or the size should be less than 100 nanometer. Now, what is the problem with the micron lens scale particle is that when you subject the material to the tensile loading or any kind of loading, the particle can break as you see on the left hand side image or they can debond from the matrix and leading to the formation of crack. If these two particle based damage mechanism are initiated, you compromise on the ductility by 80%, you compromise on the fracture toughness and you compromise on the ultimate tensile strength. And that is where when you put the nano reinforcement, you get you may get all these advantages. You can improve the ductility, you can improve the modulus, dynamic properties, high temperature stability, creep properties, wear properties, ferric properties, dry and wet corrosion resistance, ignition characteristics, electromagnetic interference, and the bioresponse. So we use some magnesium aluminum nanocomposite to show the unique capability of microwave that how fast we can do it. And we put just 0.5 volume percentage of aluminum. And if you just focus on the uh, red fonts, you will see that we are improving on the strength, whether it's a yield strength or a UTS and also the ductility. So basically, provided you put the right amount of the nano reinforcement, you can have the simultaneous improvement in the strength and ductility which cannot be realized by any other land scale of reinforcement for ceramic particles or metallic particles. We normally put the ceramic particles also. And I give you only one example of the boron carbide here. And again, you can see that both the tensile properties, just focus on the red fonts that will give you a clear picture. Just by putting 1.74% of boron carbide, you are improving the strength by 25%, UTS by 25%, and the fracture strain can be doubled up to 12.4%. If you want triple the ductility, you choose 1% of boron carbide, 17.4%. With this kind of ductility level, you can fabricate your material in any intricate shape you want to. If you look at the compressive property, once again, the issue is very clear here. You can have the improvement in the strength without compromise in the ductility. So that means your overall fracture toughness of the material is improved. We also develop new materials. Now this slide, for example, shows we developed a material with zinc, gadolinium, and calcium. And you see this property, 260 megapascal, 585 megapascal, and failure strain in this case does not go up, but it stays beyond 10%. And the grain size is also very small. So what is the importance of these numbers here? Because these numbers from this material exceed the properties of WE43 magnesium alloy, which is used for aerospace application. And this material, you can make it very cheaply rather than paying a high price for commercially available alloy. Now you see the magic of nano reinforcement. You put zinc oxide to the level of maybe 1% and you get another 100 megapascal improvement in the compressive yield stress. You get almost 100 plus megapascal improvement in UCS and your failure strain is not compromised too much. It is compromised, but it is still beyond 10%. So anything beyond 10%, you can fabricate your material into integrate shape very well.
So what is the importance of these numbers here with the nano composite? Is because now your properties are exceeding that of mild steel, such as S275 and S355. So now you can replace steels by magnesium, giving 75% weight saving. Now, one of the ways in which the material fails when they are in the service is under the cyclic loading, which is commonly called as fatigue. We did some work in collaboration with Professor Shri Watson in the University of Akron. He works on fatigue. And you see that when you take a commercial alloy, is a 31, put just 1% of carbon nanotube, you see for a given stress level, the number of cycles to failure is much higher. This is besides the improvement in the tensile properties, which has been established in general for many, many nanocomposite systems. So not only you are improving the property in the static condition, but you are also improving the property in the cyclic condition of loading. Similar results you can see from the reinforcement of AL203 at the nano lens scale for a given stress, number of cycles to failure for a nanocomposite is higher. Dynamic behavior, high strain rate loading. You are going in a car, you meet an accident. You may die in there if, if the accident is bad. So your material should become stronger under the application of collision. And that is one of the advantage which can be exhibited by the nanocomposite material. Now in this graph, you focus on the blue curve here and the black curve here. The black curve is non nanocomposite. The blue curve is a normal material. So you can see that the black curve shows higher strength and higher ductility when the strain rate is 10 to 3 per second. So under the collision, now if you use nanocomposite, your material suddenly becomes more stronger. So the probability of survival for the passenger becomes higher. And this is what the transportation companies or automobile companies actively look for. Now, since a new application are always going in more and more abusive condition. You also have to see that your material is also better than the normal material. That's how you can sell it. And some of the work in this regard we have done with, in collaboration with IIT Dhanbad, uh, with Professor Malik there. And you can see that in the graph, the blue graph is for the composite and the green is one for the material which is not a composite and for all the temperatures from 25 to 250 your composite has maintained an edge. Now if you look at aluminum based material most of the aluminum based materials are used at a temperature less than 100 degrees centigrade. Similarly if magnesium has to replace so maybe they will be used till 150 degrees centigrade to start with and in that they are definitely better than the monolithic material. So the reliability of your component, the durability of your component under that condition will increase. So let's try to look at the deformation of material uh, under high temperature, which is called as a creep. And this work we did in collaboration with uh, researchers in Germany, uh, Magic Sense for Magnesium Innovation Center. We gave them the material with tin and yttrium, and you can see again, our alloy had a better hardness and a better compressive yield and uh, compressive strength and similar ductility. And when we put zinc oxide in there, again, we get more improvement in the strength. Our yield strength also goes up. Our ultimate compressive strength goes up. And in this situation, our fracture strain also got to 27.4%, which is much higher than many, many commercial aluminum alloys. So that means this material is fabricable. And when we give it to them, the blue curve here shows the creep resistance, which is much higher for the composite material that we gave to them. So nano composites also shows better creep behavior because your reinforcement are thermally stable. Another application of metal based material in the sliding application, remember the tracks, remember the wheels, remember the reciprocating moving objects and all this thing. So, we did some work in collaboration with my colleague who, uh, who is a tribological expert and you can see just by putting 1.5% of aluminum oxide, we get 25% improvement in the wear resistance of the material. You can further increase it if you put additional calcium in there up to 3%. Now you get 50% improvement overall by putting Al2O3 and calcium. So basically 
alloy modification, use of nano reinforcement, you have made your component life one and a half time. That means if your component lasts for 10 years, now it lasts for 15 years. So that is a ad advantage we get. Now to put any material into application, it, it needs to be machined. So your material also has to be machinable. And some of the initial work we did uh, was with the researchers in IIT Delhi, uh, Professor Aravindan. We sent our samples to them. They investigated the uh, machining of the deep aspect ratio holes. And their observation was, yes, you can make these holes. They did not observe any abnormal arcing or random spark discharges. And the surface roughness was also quite acceptable in their work. We also sent some other composite samples, nano composite samples to University of Newcastle uh, at their campus in UK and, and, and Singapore. And they found that the cutting force for all the nano composite remains lower than the pure magnesium except for one composition. And they also get the fine surface roughness. So that means you can machine these materials at the same or better speed than the conventional material. Corrosion is another issue. When you expose your materials into the dry condition, it is called as oxidation. And if you look at this graph, the blue graph here is the one which corresponds to the composite material, which shows that the oxidation resistance of composite is better. And that was attributed to a very compact and thin layer, oxide layer, which prevents the interaction between the atmosphere and the base matter. We also did some work in collaboration with late Professor Bala Subramaniam uh, in IIT Kanpur. And we sent them a uh, nanocomposite sample based on AZ31 commercial alloy with AL203. And they observed that the wet corrosion resistance of the composite was almost one third that of the monolithic material. And they attributed that to the microstructural changes because of the reduction in the cathodic phase particle. So based on many years of experiments and other things, we have started creating the bubble charts. The one that you see here, the y-axis is 0.2% yield strength and the x-axis is ductility. And you can see that you can choose the reinforcement, hybrid reinforcement, metallic reinforcement, ceramic reinforcement, polymetallurgy, DMD. And depending on the end application and what kind of strength and ductility combination you want, you can choose the composition and the processing techniques and make it. So this kind of information is available in the literature. Ignition temperature, because of the misconception of the people. So we also try to investigate how this nanoparticle affect the ignition response of the material. And we found that if you put, for example, silicon dioxide particle, your Ignition temperature goes from 580 to 611 degrees centigrade, which is 30 degrees centigrade increase. Note here that magnesium auto ignites at 580 degrees centigrade, which is a very high temperature, so it's not an issue. And we realize that this is happening because the thermal conductivity of the base material is reducing, and apparently the reduction in the thermal conductivity is translating quite well with the increase in the ignition temperature. Biomaterial. Now, we need implants in the body in all kind of fractures, accidents, aging problem and all this thing. There are two types of implants, permanent implants, which are like hip implant and the knee implant. And then there are temporary implants, the kind of implants where you have a bone fracture, people or the doctor puts an implant, the fracture gets healed and the doctor removes the implant. So you have to go through two surgeries for temporary implants. So magnesium suits quite well as a temporary implant. So we tried a number of nanocomposites based on titanium TiB2, titanium dioxide, titanium carbide, and titanium nitride as a reinforcement. The first thing we have to see is that whether they have enough strength under the tensile mode. And if you look at the strength of the bone, it is 149 megapascals. The ductility is up to 2%, and all the materials here are higher than that. So that's not an issue. Then we also try to see how about the compressive properties. Once again, the maximum compressive strength of the bone is 167 megapascal, and all these nanocomposites fulfill that criteria with a very high amount of ductility. So our material or the magnesium-based material are actually stronger and tougher than the bone. Then you have to see how they react in the uh, physiological medium because at the end of the day, they go in the body. 
So you have to carry out the corrosion test in the physiological medium using certain international standard like ACM standard. And we found the corrosion rate is less than 0 0.1 millimeter per year. So then we talk with the doctor, what is the acceptable rate for you? They say 0 0.2 millimeter per year. So that means from the physiological perspective, this material will do a good job. Having said that, it's not like all the nanocomposites will do a wonderful job in the body. You, you have to do experiments, you have to get the curves like variation of the pH versus the amount and the exposure. For example, in magnesium TiO2 nanocomposite, you see that we don't want too much fluctuations in the pH, which is on the y axis. So you have for the 2.5%, for 50 days, the variation is very nominal around 7.5 here. Same results are seen in magnesium TiC nanocomposite, but at this point of time, you need only 2% of TiC. You don't need 2.5%. For TIN, again, you don't need more than 2%. So 2% is the limiting amount. So what this slide tells you is that, yes, nanocomposite can show you the good properties, but at the same time, you have to identify the right amount of reinforcement you have to put for enhancing a property. Now, we are also working with dentists to see that how it can be used in the mandibular reconstruction. And as I say, when you want to put in the body, you have to see that the cells are able to grow on that. So these doctors, they do their own tests and they did a cell viability test in which they found the cell viability is more than 80%. And when the cell viability is more than 80%, that indicates that it is zero cytotoxic. That means it is not cytotoxic and you can easily use that. They also use this LDH test to do the similar thing. And you can see that most of the materials are having zero cytotoxicity. Even if it is slightly more than 25%, for example, in this situation of 1.5 serum dioxide, it is still okay. It should not be the moderate or it should not be the severe cytotoxicity zero and mild is acceptable similarly we put the nano silica nanosphere also and again you can see that of course you see an improvement in the hardness of the nanocomposite improvement in the yield strength and improvement in the ucs and for two percent less io2 your corrosion rate is also very very low in the physiological medium which is hang buffered saline solution so we are also trying to develop the material which are even lighter by very judiciously using the alloying element. So what you see here, this piece of the magnesium, pure magnesium is settled here. So it sinks in the water. But if you use a proper alloying element, you can make it float on the water. It is still below the water surface. We want to take it above the water surface like a ship. So that is the future direction we are focusing on. So in conclusion, I would like to say that magnesium based material, including nanocomposite, have tremendous potential in both engineering and biomedical application. It's a multi-billion dollar market for grab. Uh, I think if I combine both engineering and biomedical application, you can easily look at hundred billion dollar market. You can use magnesium or process magnesium using the conventional processing method. It doesn't need any fancy or state-of-the-art equipment which will cost you millions of dollars, not really like that. What do you use for aluminum? You can tweak it in bits and pieces and you can use for magnesium also. You have seen that how the nanoparticles has been very capable of increasing multiple engineering and biomedical properties of magnesium material. So this is one way to develop the material, but this is not the only way. You can also use the alloying element. You can also use the amorphous reinforcement. You can also use a hollow reinforcement, some of the work that we are currently doing. So in final, my message is this technology has arrived. Some countries in the world, they have been able to see this and they are positioning themselves for almost 20 years now, but there are also many countries which has not done that. And Essentially, I think it's the right time someone has to talk with the uh, think tank to the government, bring it to their knowledge, because this kind of technology is not only useful for us, it is useful for the environment, it is also useful for the planet we live on. 
And that's where I conclude my talk with a word of acknowledgement to all my students who have worked for all these years uh, in developing this technology. Thank you very much. And I will be happy to take questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, thank you for the excellent and mind-blowing presentation on magnesium uh, technology. Uh, thank you for introducing uh, the technology from ancient times to current trend. Uh, exclusively, you covered all parts of the magnesium technology especially for magnesium for plants, magnesium for healthy humans and electromagnetic shielding. Magnesium has increasing crop yield and shielding effectiveness of magnesium versus aluminum. Magnesium has promising replacement for uh, biomedical aluminum, titanium and steel for the highlights of your uh, talk. Uh, potential application in automobile, marine, and aerospace sectors are very useful and thought-provoking. Thank you for highlighting the application of magnesium in robotics and uh, high-speed trains. And the processing techniques uh, gave you a new idea for young researchers and uh, scientists who are working on this area. A uh, lot of questions are coming. Uh, I would like to uh, ask take three or four questions from that and the remaining can be answered offline. And uh, uh, one question is from uh, Geeta Sundaram, uh, asking about the welding challenge of magnesium. Uh, well, there are no challenges because if you see the history of that and you've seen even a full plane is made of magnesium. So that means uh, the magnesium is quite weldable, but as you also know that beyond 580 degrees centigrade, it can catch fire. So you have to be sh and you have to ensure that when you do the welding, you do in the inert atmosphere. So once you do in the inert atmosphere, you can do it. Also, be aware that there is a new technique which is called as a friction steer welding, which can very easily be used without any problem for magnesium also. So uh, one question from uh, Mr. Raja, uh, what are all the advantages and limitations of HCP structure in magnesium alloys? Uh, what is the uh, advantages and limitation of? HCP structure. Well, HCP structure gives you the limited ductility, but that can be overcome by using judicially the alloying element. For example, if you add just 0.4 cerium to magnesium, you can take the ductility to 20 to 25 percent, which is much beyond the ductility levels of aluminum based material. You don't need that kind of ductility because if you look at commercially used aluminum based material, which are currently the lightweight material of choice, you see that many of these alloys do not have more than 10% ductility. They all fluctuate between 5 to 8% of the ductility. And you can easily get uh, that kind of ductility from magnesium by EZ31, for example, when you put aluminum in magnesium, you can do that. And by nanoparticle, you can also, you have seen many examples in my slide that you can easily reach 20%, 25% of the ductility. So that is not an issue, actually. Uh, and uh, another question is from uh, Rajendra Murli and Sivaramakrishnan. Can we use magnesium nanocomposite for uh, knee replacement or dental replacement? Uh, okay. Uh, no, uh, not in the knee replacement because as I indicated in my talk, knee and hip are the permanent implants. You want them for the rest of your life. But magnesium is a temporary implant. That means the fracture is healed and the material dissolves in the body. So you don't need a second surgery. You save on the patient trauma and doctor's time. You do not use magnesium for permanent implant. 
okay now let's go to the uh, dental application in dental application there are two types of application one is for example you want to fix a tooth and you need an implant for that again you don't want that implant to corrode so you need bio inert material like titanium but there are many spores which lead to the fracture of the jaw and a lot of mandibular damages which are temporary which can be healed in a one month to two months time and the whole recovery process take maybe about one year to get back to the normal functioning so till they're fracturing then you can use magnesium based implants in your what is a maxillofacial applications okay so once again remember and differentiate between the permanent implant and the temporary implant so magnesium suits as a temporary implant Next question. Professor Sivaraman. Maybe they have some issue with the yeah. line. Yeah, no, okay. Uh, okay. There was a problem with uh, okay. okay. And, uh, can I ask uh, one? Uh, yeah. yeah. Can I ask one more question? Please. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, this, this question is from Krishna. Uh, Please know for finishing one topic for automobiles. Your question is not clear. Your voice was breaking down. Can you repeat the question? Uh, application of magnesium boron carbide for automobile parts it can be used uh, uh, the properties are very favorable and uh, it all depends now whether the industry comes in take the material and use it because to use the material in a part a part is subjected to certain kind of loading and it has certain design so company, when the company comes in, they try to see that for a given part and for a given design, what is the stress distribution? Then they look at the tensile and compressive properties, what we are reporting, and they see whether they fit in there or not. If they fit in, you can use it. For example, uh, so, one example uh, I have shown for the Porsche uh, uh, car in which the magnesium sheet was used in the roof area. So roof area is not a loaded area. Correct. So in that case, they have just used a commercial alloy and then convert it into a sheet and use it. So this question is from Dr. Ramanujam. Uh, machinability of uh, magnesium alloy, aluminium uh, nano composite by using grinding. Well, you can do this. It again depends on the thing, but whatever application or the machining series. Uh, we have done in collaboration is by EDM, electro discharge machining and using the convention lathe. So the results that we have got so far is using this technique. So you can always use other techniques to machine it. But as I say, when you use a new technique, you have to do some work on that to establish the correct parameters. This may be the last question. Uh... From Sentil Kumar, uh, magnesium al aluminium nano composite. How is the corrosion rate in marine environment? Well, you have to do the testing in the 3.5% NaCl solution immersion testing. You can do that uh, depending on the part and the processing history of. If you identify a component, you have to see that how that component has to be made. For example, will it to be rolled or extruded? Once you do that, you choose this material, bring it to that processing condition and just do a very simple immersion testing in that so the results that you get from there you can use it for that but having said that what people doing like if you recall that even the steels that we use in our application they're all coated by zinc or by paint correct because even the normal steels will corrode in the sea environment so they're all protected by sacrificial protection and this and that all metal corrodes all metal needs a protective layer or compositionally modified or 
other kind of protection. So magnesium, you have to bring the same thing in there. Maybe the coating is the most useful. Just put a coating and use it. Yeah, now I request uh, Dr. Yervina, uh, any question from your side? Uh, actually, uh, they have uh, already have a creation. Uh, I already, they have some creation already asked just now. So I'm okay with the creation, the answer. Now, uh, now I request uh, uh, Professor Farooq. Yes, I have a simple question. Uh, to Professor Gupta now, is there a possibility for us to work together in developing new materials, including materials based on magnesium? Yeah, we can actually. Miss, I if you've seen my talk, my samples have gone to many many parts and many many labs of the world actually. So yeah. I'm I'm always open to the collaboration. So as long as you know that how you want to use the material and what kind of expertise you have uh, we are good in making materials and our materials are quite new and unique to us so you know we can always create new science and engineering uh, based on your expertise so we can couple our strength of making materials we can give you in that suited draw shape in the s cast condition and you can take it from there okay thank you If there are uh, no more questions uh, from our uh, academic partners, then I would like to uh, propose the word of thanks, followed by uh, Multimedia University and Southeastern University. Uh, on behalf of uh, EGS Pillai, uh, group of institutions, uh, I would like to thank the speaker, Professor Manoj Gupta, sir, for taking uh, time to uh, present uh, uh, on magnesium technology on this day. Uh, he was a very busy scientist in the world. Uh, and uh, thank you for accepting our uh, invitation. On behalf of uh, all the three uh, institutions, I would like to thank you. And uh, I thank on behalf of the chairman, secretary, CEO, principal, dean, HODs, senior professors and professors and young faculty members for their continuous support from EGS Pillai group of institutions. I thank you, sir. Uh, now I request uh, uh, Dr. Ervina to thank. Uh, OK, thank you, Prof. Uh, Siva Raman. So on behalf of uh, Multimedia University, uh, I, uh, Dr. Ervina Afzal Mohamad Noor, uh, research Program and Collaboration Center, Multimedia University. Uh, also, would like to thank to you, Dr. Manoj Gupta, uh, with the wonderful uh, presentations. So perhaps we will have a, a, another uh, webinar together. <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, and also uh, perhaps we have a collaboration between uh, MMU and also uh, NUS. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Professor Farooq, sir. Sorry, there was an interruption. I'm on behalf of the Southeastern University of Sri Lanka and, and its uh, Faculty of Engineering and also its Department of Mechanical Engineering. I thank Professor Manoj Gupta very much. This uh, lecture of today was an uh, eye opener to all materials, scientists, and engineers. We used to use magnesium as a supporting material, but today you started with magnesium and then you explain how magnesium can play its role in all spheres of engineering and also, particularly, in life saving. Uh, efforts. I thank you very much for your contribution. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, all the participants and uh, uh, listeners. I, uh, once again, I thank uh, Professor Manoj Gupta, uh, Dr. Ervina Abzan, Dr. Farooq for their 
continuous support thank you very much thank you now i am closing now i am closing the rooms yeah. thank you thank you thank you everyone <laughs> yeah thank you and stay in touch yeah, yeah. please thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah.